Alfonso's Arctic Adventure is classic NES done right, because it was made and developed for the NES. It's an action-based semi-puzzle platformer, both based on and created by the same creator as the Eskimo Bob Flash cartoon. There's reference abound for fans of that, but plenty of challenge and content for those who have no idea who this stick-wielding green parkit adventure is. But that's not all you want to hear, is it? This isn't the kind of game that's going to have much to spoil in the way that most people are going to care, but spoilers after the card regardless. The game's cheap enough to try out for yourself if you're intrigued, but if you're sticking around, let's go poke the walrus. The game's plot isn't exactly needed. It's very self-referential to an early 2000s Flash cartoon that's very... early 2000s Flash cartoon. You know, crude art and animation that's barely there, comedy based around characters more than a narrative, and most episodes containing a plot that doesn't really exist, if it isn't just being a parody of something else entirely. Like a massive Dragon Ball Z-themed episode, or another one where the whole thing's in French. Hey, Bob. <laughs> I found a stick. Let's go poke something. Let's go poke the walrus. I've watched all 50 plus episodes of this web series, and the only reliable thing I can tell you about Eskimo Bob is that he eats raw fish and he's cool. Well, there's a lot for fans of the series to be nostalgic for, but the game is very much playable and enjoyable without that knowledge. And it makes about as much sense. All you need to know for this game is that Bob went missing, and collecting fish will somehow help you find out where he went. The game showed up on my radar when friend and former colleague Phalus tweeted about it in support of his friend, Thomas, who, under the developer name Spoonie Bard Productions, created two Eskimo Bob games based upon the web series that he also created. Say what you will about the series, that is some dedication to your characters. You can even see Spoonie Bard Productions working on the NES beat-em-up throwback Jane Silent Bob's Mall Brawl. Though I didn't really get into playing the game until I went to MAGFest in January of this year, as it was set up with other homebrew games in one of the indie kiosks, I found it the most fascinating titles of the ones I played. You may be wondering why I'm not looking at the first Eskimo Bob title, considering Alfonso's Arctic Adventure is the second game, but this is one of those fairly common cases among indie games, where the original game and the sequel are fundamentally the same title, but the second is just a fleshed out version with more features, making the original game potentially irrelevant. Alfonso's Arctic Adventure features a map-based progression, more interesting, varied, and better designed stages, and much better boss fights, as opposed to the original game's same boss but harder each time approach. Take a look at Hand of Fate versus its sequel for a good idea of another game that falls into that category, but overall, Alfonso's a classic case of same game as the first, but vastly improved. While the indie market isn't a stranger to making throwback titles in 8-bit NES style, Alfonso's Arctic Adventure holds one up on that. With a proper cartridge, this game can be played on the NES. The game was just released on Steam, but I'm playing this on an NES emulator right now that's causing that annoying black bar in the corner. Now you can't unsee it, sorry about that. There's an entire market for these homebrew NES titles, and it's fascinating seeing what some developers will come up with for their titles from a modern game design perspective, while still working with the heavy restrictions of NES hardware. There's no modern effects, no modern music, no seven-layer parallax scrolling, just a 64-color palette, basic five-channel sound chip, and all of the colors, sprites, and memory limitations that those would include. In turn, you can imagine where the music is going. It does well with what it has, recreating the Eskimo Bob theme in a jaunty, upbeat way that will cement itself in your psyche seconds after hearing it and won't wear off for at least a week. I'm not going to play the original theme here because I'm warning you it will get stuck no matter what you do, so music from this game only. In turn, sound effects also make fine use of the noise channels, and it'll sound very familiar to those used to gaming in that era. Collecting fish is a very satisfying coin collection kind of sound as well. The game isn't all that hard to understand gameplay-wise, but it's not easily described in case you're wondering whatever the hell I meant by action-based semi-puzzle platformer. Each stage is divided into short sections. Some will loop infinitely and others have clearly defined walls and borders. Each stage is completed by collecting every fish on the level. Fish being your basic and only collectible, similar to coins in most platformers, as they float around in groups scattered around various areas. 
The challenge lies in figuring out how to collect each of these fish, as some might be out of reach, across a large gap, or blocked by bricks or enemies. Alfonso will have to use his stick to solve the puzzles, or enlist the help of a few other characters, each with their own abilities and disadvantages. Any damage you take is a one-hit kill, forcing you to start the stage over again. Lose all your lives and you'll start the stage over again, but you get a password to save your progress. This is a properly old-school game, after all. You can easily get extra lives with each stage's hidden collectible, the Golden Fish, as it'll grant you a life on a collection and will always be hidden inside a snow block. If you lose a life on that stage, you can collect the Golden Fish again and ensure that you won't run out of attempts if you don't die before you collect it. And there's a counter for the overall number of Golden Fish in the game, but that will reset in the event of a game over. With one-hit KOs on the table, a game over is likely and definitely possible. Like most games of this era, it's better to read over the pattern behavior of each enemy and see how to best handle them before you rush in, even if the game over penalty isn't really much of a penalty. Enemies range from the cavalcade of Eskimo Bob episodes, like a yeti, alien businessmen, flying noses, a pigeon named Maurice, clones of a goblin named Yuck that I am not going to get into the origin of, and some others as well. Not every NPC on the map is an enemy, as you can make use of the walrus by poking him with a stick to move him and use him as a platform. The club-wielding seal that can knock you into the air like a bounce pad, and the fish in a spaceship. If you have any idea what kind of power he has in this game, it's mostly to carry your characters across large gaps. Whenever you locate an igloo, you can swap between the default character Alfonso and one of three others, Magnus, Fenwood, and The Girl. The character you find will be assigned to that stage, and re-entering will only switch you back to Alfonso, which does come across as a mechanic rather often. Alfonso is the second worst jump height in the game, but can use his stick to interact with things, kill enemies, and break snow blocks that are directly in front of him. You'll spend most of the game as him. Magnus was created in the series as a one-off reference to the Transformers movie. Basically, he's Bob in sunglasses, and he must be hated for his comedy routines on Twitter because he's always punching down. God, that's a terrible joke. His jump height is far better than Alfonso, and the second best height of the four. Fenwood is a fat guy who can barely jump, moves rather slow, but has the distinct benefit of being completely invincible unless he's hit by projectiles like snowballs. Enemies will die the instant they touch him, but he'll instantly fall through any snow blocks that you stand on, so you can't rely on him to get around the stage too often. The girl functionally is the best character of the four, with the highest jump height, fastest speed, and a ranged attack, but she can't duck down into tight spaces, which is her only disadvantage. And of course, it's a disadvantage planned exactly within many of the stages that she'll appear in. Her sword can even go through walls by design. Using each character to complete the stages, it's possible to come across hidden exits within some of the snow blocks. Using these by pressing up will take you to a new area, usually with no hazards and another golden fish to locate. Completing the hidden exit will open up a shortcut path on the main map as well, which is great for people looking to reach the end faster, but they could possibly open up a path to even harder hidden stages that wouldn't appear normally. I'm the annoying type who tries to clear every stage before moving on to the boss, so I try not to take the shortcuts. Speaking of, there's a lot of variations to the bosses in this game. It's a polar opposite to the original, where every boss stage had you attacking a spaceship. In this game, bosses range from a fusion of man and penguin, the maturity elf, an evil snowflake, the Easter Bunny, an anglerfish, and the goblin creature known as Yuck. Keeping a good eye on boss patterns is very important, and not every boss uses the same mechanics. Some will require different characters during the fight, and one, like the Easter Bunny, requires you to indirectly dispatch him by matching colored eggs to remove the floor from beneath him. The one-hit KO carries over to these fights as well, so it might frustrate you to get cheap shot on the last phase, but most of the bosses have a very distinct pattern that will make most of them a breeze when you figure them out. My personal tip for taking down Perfect Yuck is to wait until he's fired off four shots, then hit him so you can attack the slow clone, then turn around and attack the real one as it bounces back towards you. It's a pretty frustrating fight, but it's easy to manipulate once you know how it works. With Yuck defeated, the sun is safe, and Alfonso and friends can return home to find Bob. There's not much else to the game beyond that, but if you have a friend along, there's a simple two-player battle mode that you can mess around with. While I can't imagine that there's too much of a demand for a true NES throwback game, what this game is and what it set out to do was handled perfectly with the limitations that this kind of indie development has. While it's definitely not an easy sell for everyone, the same could easily be said for the series it's based on, on all the game's merits, Alfonso's Arctic Adventure still earns a go rating for me. 
The challenge and the charm are there, especially for anyone that's missing that true NES platformer experience, while it still offers up a fun time for the price of entry. Yeah, I really should just make a generic one of these where I say the same thing over and over again and only insert information where it needs to change. You know, like that influencer script that everyone gives for Raid Shadow Legends. Be sure to immerse yourself in the story of the like button and check out the detail on that subscribe button by giving both a click. Indie Stop has been viewed nearly several times on Twitter over the last six months with a near perfect score of at ChaosD1 or at Indie Stop. One of the most ambitious Twitch streams of 2019 is still being released over at twitch.tv slash chaosd1. Use the referral code patreon.com slash chaosd1 for a possibly useless amount of in-game items and some epic champion patrons like Neander, Sonic Rose, Kaizmei, and A. Smith. And check out the roadmap that'll likely be ignored so I can release reviews on whenever the hell I want. Except for those two request reviews, I should get on that.